to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Word of God says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. We welcome you today to our study of the religion of Islam. Is Islam a friendly and peaceful religion? Is it compatible with Christianity? Are Muslims friends of Christians? And more importantly, is Islam and was Muhammad a true follower of God? And is it true to the teaching of God? These are things we want to consider today in our study of Islam. And so we welcome you to our study of this religion. We hope that you'll have your Bible handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in searching some of these matters as well. As always, we want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of Bible study materials there. We have video, audio, articles, questions and answers, a whole lot of good material that will help you. Again, that's thegospelofchrist.com. We hope you'll check that out. And also, we encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. Wherever you are viewing our broadcast, we hope that you'll stop by in that area and visit the Church of Christ. You'll find friendly people who love the Lord and His Word and are always looking to meet new people. If you've got a Bible question or something you've been considering or would like to study the Bible further, we also want to encourage you to write to us or email us or call us at the information that will be given, and we'd love to correspond with you concerning religious matters. Let's now direct our attention to the subject of Islam. Is Islam really a friendly and peaceful religion? We've been told by media outlets and various scholarly institutes that religion and the, the Islam of religion is peaceful. What you see going on in the world really doesn't represent uh, the true nature of Islam. Those are just extremist factions. Is that true? D does the Quran portray Islam as peaceful? Friend, it's really not true. When you read the Quran, you will find that the people who are committing acts of terror across the world are actually following the Quran in many ways. And so when you read and study the Quran, many times Muhammad would encourage his followers, as we're going to show from the Quran, to create acts of violence or to perpetrate acts of violence against those who they will refer to as disbelievers. And so let's turn our attention for just a moment to what the Quran actually says about unbelievers, uh, disbelievers, Christians, and Jews, and how the Muslim ought to relate to them. And incidentally, when we say Quran, for those who may not know, the Quran would be like the Bible uh, of Islam. It is what they believe is the word from God for believers in Muhammad and the Muslim faith. And so the Quran is their religious book, and we'll talk about more about it later. But here's what the Quran says about this religion. Did you know that the Quran actually teaches that Muslims really want to kill unbelievers? Now, friend, we're not making this up. The Quran says in chapter 2, verse 191, these words, And kill them wherever you find them, and turn them out from wherever they have turned you out, and disbelief is worse than killing. This is talking about the heretic. This will be talking about the unbeliever. This will be talking about the polytheist, who they believe Christians and Jews are polytheists. And it says, kill them wherever you find them. Turn them out. Disbelief in Allah and Muhammad is worse than killing somebody else. And so sometimes we think to ourselves, how could the events 
that happened in, in America that are terror related? How could the events in London or, or Turkey or some other place, how could someone do those horrible things in the name of religion? Well, friend, the Quran actually commands and teaches those ideas to its followers. Here's what the Quran says in chapter 5, verse number 51. O believers, take not Jews and Christians as friends. They are friends of each other. Those of you who make them his friend is one of them. God does not guide an unjust people. And so we ask, is Islam a, a religion of friendliness? Are they friends of Christians and Jews? Well, right out of the Quran we noticed. Allegedly, Allah claiming that Jews and Christians are not friends of Muslims. They're friends of each other's. And it specifically says, do not take them as friends. And so while the media, while other outlets have told us that it is a religion of friendliness, friend, you don't find that in the Quran. You read the Quran and you find the opposite of that. Listen to what the Quran says in chapter 8, verse number 12. Allegedly, Allah says, I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. A friend, does that sound like a religion of peace? Does that sound like a religion of friendliness and kindness and love? Not at all. Cast terror into their hearts? We wonder, why are these terrorist acts being done? Why would somebody drive a truck through a crowd and kill multitudes of people? Why set off a bomb and blow up buildings? Why, why create all this terror? Friend, that's exactly what the Quran is teaching. Cast terror into their hearts. Cut off their head, cut off every fingertip. Friend, this is not a religion of friendliness and kindness. Kindness. When you read the Quran, these are some of the things it commands. In fact, in the Quran, we actually learn that they want to intimidate and they want to do harm to other people, others who are not of the Muslim religion. Listen to what the Quran says in chapter 9, verse number 30. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the Son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the sayings of those who disbelieve before. May Allah destroy them how they are turned away. And then in the Quran, in chapter 61, verse 4, Surely Allah loves those who fight in His way. How do, how do Muslims feel about Christians and Jews? How do they feel about people who are trying to follow the Bible? Their prayer is that Allah, God, in their mind, will ultimately destroy them. And in their mind, God loves those who fight in His way. And so we wonder, how can how come a very young age, how from a very young age, how could someone strap a bomb to their body? How could someone do the horrible terrorist acts they do? Friend, when you read the words of the Quran, those things are seen as going to happen, good to happen, and something that Allah allegedly loves for His followers to do. And so the Quran is not a religion of peace and happiness. Here's another passage, that's passage in the Quran that is really shocking. In the Quran, chapter 66, verse 9, the words of Allah written from Muhammad are allegedly these. O Prophet, this is Allah's words to Muhammad. O Prophet, strive or fight against the disbelievers, that be Christians and Jews, anybody who doesn't accept Islam, strive or fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be stern or harsh with them. Hell will be their home, a hapless journey's end. Peace, friendliness, kindness, love, those are not words you would associate with those kind of ideas. And so they're encouraged. Muhammad is encouraged to fight against them, to be harsh with them. And their end result in their mind is going to be hell, a life filled with misery and unkindness. And so, again, this is not, it may have been told to us, we, some may have bought into the idea. 
It's not a religion when you read the Quran of friendliness and kindness. Here's what the Quran says in chapter 3, verses 157 through 158. The Quran says to the Muslim, If you should die or be killed in the cause of Allah, His mercy and forgiveness would surely be better than all the riches they, that's the hypocrites or the unbelievers, they would amass. If you should die or be killed before Him, you shall all be gathered. And so, in essence, being killed or being a martyr or dying, killing somebody who's not uh, a Muslim, that's actually looked at as good and, and valuable and something to be attained to in this religion. Now, friend, Christians, although we may try to teach and convert others, our goal is not to kill or be unkind or do harm to other people. You know, sometimes I wonder, how do, you know, we're asked this sometimes, how do Muslims really feel about other people? How do they really feel about Christians and Jews and, and people who don't believe in anything? Well, friend, the Quran tells us exactly how they feel, and it is not a good feeling. The Quran says in chapter 98, verse 6, The unbelievers among the people of the book, that's the Bible, okay? Unbelievers would be Christians and Jews, and the book is the Bible. The unbelievers among the people of the book and the pagans, that's those who don't believe in anything, worldly people, and the pagans shall burn forever in the fire of hell. They are the vilest of all creatures. Well, doesn't leave much to question, does it? How do they really feel about other people who are not Muslims, pagans, Unbelievers, people of the book, Christians and Jews, they'll burn forever in hell. They're the vilest of all creatures. Doesn't sound like peace and, and friendliness and love and kindness, does it? And so when we really think about what the religion of Islam teaches and believes, it leaves little wonder why they do the things that they do. If someone is really going to follow the Quran, it is naturally going to lead to violent, immoral, uh, acts of, of terror created upon other people. And so it is a religion that is not associated with peace and kindness, but violence and terror. And so let's take just a few moments to study what exactly Islam is, get a little bit of the introduction and background to it, and then in the next three lessons we'll consider, is this religion from God? Was Muhammad really a prophet? And how do Islam's view Christ and Christianity in our upcoming lessons? All right, we know this about Islam. Islam is believed to be somewhere around one-fifth of the world's population. It is believed to be one of the fastest growing religions in the world and in the United States. People are buying into this more and more. It's now the second most popular religion on the planet with more than a billion, some estimates say 1.5 billion followers. Whether I realize it or not, I'm going to come in contact with Muslims in this world. Now, to kind of show how fast it's growing, in the United States around the year 1970, there were about maybe 100,000 Muslims. 2008, 38 years later, 9 million, from 100,000 in 38 years to 9 million Muslims, and no doubt that number is even greater now. In fact, it is estimated worldwide, and again, these are just estimates, but it's estimated worldwide that there are 1.5 plus billion followers of the Muslim religion. Again, second uh, largest world religion that exists. And so why would a Christian want to study this? Friend, because world events that have occurred are directly linked to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and those who are really following the Quran and the words of Muhammad. I, I want to know how they feel. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know what this religion is about. But, but more maybe importantly than that, friend, if I'm going to follow the Bible command to seek and to search all things, I've got to see whether this is true or not. Acts 17, 11, I've got to search the scriptures. I've got to prove all things. I've got to study to show myself approved unto God. But then maybe as importantly as any of this, or as importantly as any of this, how am I going to know how to talk to a Muslim 
about the Lord, about His church, about the false ideas and contradictions of the faith of Islam, if I don't know anything about it myself, I believe we need to be reaching these people. I believe these people are following a religion that is in error and we need to reach out to them with true love and kindness and the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we begin by asking and, and noting some fundamental terms in Islam. Here's just some kind of the main ideas of this religion. One of the key words that you will hear over and over is the word Allah. The word Allah uh, in the Islam faith means the God, and it is a, de a description that encompasses all the attributes of God. The supreme God, uh, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, kind of would be the idea of, uh, of the Christian word. And so you hear Allah, and that word to them just means the supreme God. Islam then, the word means submission to Allah. If we say, what is the religion of Islam? It is just simply saying it is a religion that submits to Allah or God. And so if someone is a follower of Islam, they're submitting to the teachings of Muhammad and following Allah in that way. Muslim then is one who submits to Allah. If Islam is submission to Allah, then a Muslim is one who submits to that, just like a Christian is a follower of Christ in that sense. And so a Muslim would be someone who submits to Allah, and the prophet Muhammad and his teachings. Another word that you may hear is the word Kaaba, and the word Kaaba literally means cube. This is a central shrine of worship in Mecca where Muslims often will go, at least once uh, in their lifetime, will go on a pilgrimage to this place. And you may have seen images where they're circling that, that cube, the Kaaba in Mecca. And so that's one of the things that you'll also hear, and we'll say just a more, some more about that in just a minute. Now, it's Im impossible to really relate the history of Islam without looking at some of the details of the main person who's behind it, Muhammad. Muhammad and his story is one that is directly connected with Islam. Who is Muhammad? Muhammad was born in Mecca, in Arabia, in the year 530. He's considered, Muhammad is considered by Muslims to be the last of a continuing chain of prophets to restore the true religion. And so he's, in their view, the final prophet, the continuation of the prophets to restore true religion. Islam, like Judaism and Christianity, does have some ties to the patriarch Abraham. Ishmael, as you remember, uh, you have Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, the handmaid of Abraham. Ishmael was the son of Abraham, born to him by an Egyptian slave named Hagar. The Bible tells us that when Sarah gave birth to Isaac, Ishmael and Hagar were sent away into the desert of Paran or Mecca. According to the Quran, Abraham and Ishmael built together the holiest sanctuary in Islam, allegedly the Kaaba. This was thought to be the site of Adam's original place of worship. Now, in the back corner of this cube, this place of worship, uh, allegedly there's a black meteorite embedded in a silver frame, and the Quran says that Allah told Abraham that it should be a place of pilgrimage. And so, you know, sometimes we wonder, what's all the fighting about over there? Why is there so much discord? Well, friend, that's existed from the time of Isaac and Ishmael, and the descendants of Muslims claim to be, or the Muslims claim to be the descendants of Ishmael, and Isaac and Ishmael were at war. There was always fighting between them, and there still is unto this day. And so we think a little bit about this. Now, here's some other facts about Muhammad. At an early age, Muhammad became orphaned. Both of his parents were killed, and he was taken in by his grandfather and then his uncle. When he was a teenager, allegedly some uh, Christian monk, Catholic monk, identified supposedly marks on his body that signified his status as a prophet. Now, at the age of 40, Muhammad then made a spiritual journey during the month of Ramadan to a cave. It was during this retreat that allegedly Gabriel began to reveal the Quran to Muhammad. And thus, over about the next 23 years of Muhammad's life, the Quran was allegedly revealed to him bit by bit. 
And thus the Quran teaches that Jews and Christians have distorted the pure uh, monotheistic one God religion of, uh, of Allah and thus Muhammad was sent to restore and supplement the prophets and the apostles and their teaching. Now this idea about Christians and Jews being polytheist, where does all that come from? Well, the idea of the Trinity was a big part of what people had a problem with and Muhammad had a problem with. We believe there is only one God. Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image. And so going back to the book of Genesis, we believe no doubt there's one God, but there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Christians are referred to or Jews as polytheists, that's what they're saying. Because we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we believe there's more than one God. Of course, that not being true, we believe the one God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's one in purpose, one in plan, one in design, and one in His mission to save mankind. Now, going back to this retreat that Muhammad made, it was during this retreat that Muslims, when he made the retreat to the cave where Gabriel allegedly uh, unveiled to him, revealed to him the, the Quran, it was during this retreat that Muhammad supposedly received the first of an ongoing series of revelations that were later turned into the Quran. After Muhammad received these revelations, he was then instructed to go and publicly preach them. It was the public proclamation of these that brought Muhammad such great persecution. You can read about the battles. He's kicked out of multiple cities for teaching this. And so they'll say the reason that happened was because he was actually teaching the ideas of uh, the Quran to him. Now, the year 622. As you study the history of Islam, the year 622 is one of those really significant years in Muslim history. In this year, Muhammad was invited, actually told to leave Mecca, and so he came to Medina. It is this year that changes the status of the prophet from persecuted to actually being appreciated or accepted. The Muslim era is actually calculated from this year in which this event took place. It's known as the Hijra, that is uh, the pilgrimage, the departing. It's a central part of Muslim history. Because of Muhammad's acceptance at Medina, what happens is war breaks out between Mecca and Medina. Uh, eventually, Medina uh, defeats Mecca, and there are constant battles between those, these two forces, each claiming victory over time. Now, why are we saying all that? Well, kind of again to give the history, but to show even at that time, People didn't accept the teaching. Many people did not accept the teaching of Muhammad. They want to highlight these ideas, but not all of them bring about things in a good light. And so about 630, the year 630, Muhammad returns back to Mecca. Uh, the Kaaba is purged. The place of worship is purged. And it becomes the center of Muslim religion. Now, the year 632 is off to a very important point in uh, the history of Islam. This is the year that Muhammad actually died. And thus, before and during the time of his death, Muhammad actually made one fatal mistake that has haunted Islam to this very day. He forgot to appoint or did not appoint or dictate how the new spiritual and political leader of Islam was to be appointed. Because of this error, Muslims have been divided ever since. You know, there are two main factions in Islam. And you may have heard about this more in the war in Afghanistan or the war in Iraq. The two factions are the Sunnis and the Shiites. The Sunnis hate the Shiites. The Shiites hate the Sunnis. They both believe the other is trying to steal power. And it's all about power and a little money. Well, a whole lot of money. But a lot of it is about power and money. And so what does all this come down to? After Muhammad's death, his friend Abu Bakr was selected as the first caliph, that is the successor to the prophet. The only problem was there was already a caliph, uh, another legitimate option as a caliph. The courageous and trustworthy cousin of Muhammad, his name was Ali, who was married to Muhammad's favorite daughter, Fatima, could have been chosen. And so one side believed this man should be the leader. Another side believed this man should be the leader. Muhammad didn't tell who was going to be the leader. And thus, the Sunnis and the Shiites. 
They've been fighting about it ever since. The Sunnis claim that the elected caliph is their leader, while the Shiites claim that the actual blood descendants of Muhammad are their leaders. And so you've got war and fighting and struggling. Why are they killing each other over there? Why are they fighting so much? They can't decide who's in power. They can't decide who's going to get the prize and the money that goes with that. And thus the Sunnis and the Shiites have been fighting each other ever since. Now, are there common things that these two parties have and uh, ideas that they hold that are the same? Sure. Both parties are branches of Islam. Both follow the five pillars of Islam, the Quran, and believe Allah is the only God. And both believe that Mecca is a sacred place and that the pilgrimage is something they should follow. The Sunnis believe their leaders should be elected by the community, while the Shiites believe it needs to be an actual follower, uh, an actual descendant of Muhammad's family. And so this helps us to understand a little bit about the history of Islam. And really we want to show today as well that from the Quran, we're going to look at the Quran a whole lot more. We're going to examine a lot of things about that in our upcoming lessons. But we wanted to show you from the Quran as well that this is not a religion of peace and friendliness at its heart and core. We've seen passages today that show that. Now, how does that different how is that different from Christianity? Even someone who's not a Christian, even someone who may be doing things that are against the will of God, what does the Bible teach a Christian ought to do to that person? Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Uh, we're to help, to do good, to look for opportunities to teach. That's real love and kindness showed by our actions. And so as we consider these things, our hope and prayer is that you'll continue to study the subject with us as we're going to look at the evidence and the proof that shows the religion of Islam and Muhammad himself is not from God. It is a farce. People have been duped and deceived into believing it. And you can see from the evidence for yourself that these things are not true, that many of us have been lied to about it, and that we can know what is right, what is from God, and we can know God's way has been revealed to us in the Bible. His divine will, Jesus is the Son of God, and may we continue to put our trust and our hope in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.